and um, I just decided to start back up the Bible studies again and just start talking to you about my thoughts and what's going on today. Um, how I feel about what's going on right now is, um, hold on, something just popped up. So anyway, I thought I would do a Bible study on Jeremiah 23, verse 7. Now, this is also written in Jeremiah chapter 16. Um, it talks about, it's, it's a prophecy um, that refers to the a people or a group of people um, known as the children of Israel. So... A lot of people might apply this prophecy to the um, location called Israel in the land of Israel today. And that might be a proper way to apply it. Um, but I'm more applying it to a group of people that are the seed line of Israel. So I know a lot of you out there might be familiar with the seed line of Israel um, being uh, those children of Israel that went over the Caucasus Mountains, um, which is north, just north of Israel, and they went on into Europe and, and also into the Americas. So kind of talking about British Israel um, and including America. And so what this scripture verse is saying in the book of Jeremiah, chapter 23, is that one day, and I'll just read it to you, um, that God is going to bring those people back from that land. So Jeremiah 23 says um, in verse 7, it says, Therefore look, the days are coming, says the Lord, and they will no longer say, as the Lord lives, who brought up the house of Israel from the land of Egypt. So if you remember that one, that was the Exodus. They're no longer going to say how awesome God is that did that. They're going to say, uh, but as the Lord lives, who gathered all the seed of Israel, seed being the children of Israel, from the land of the north and from all the territories, that means everywhere in the whole world, he brought up that those people, where he had thrust them and restore them to their land. So, there's basically, in how I see this, is a prophecy of things to come. And that it has not happened yet. So a lot of people say, well, the children of Israel have returned to Israel. The Jews are in the land. Um, I think that there's more of them than just one tribe of Judah. And I think that not, I don't even think the tribe of Judah is, is there in the land. I think that many of Judah is in America today going along lines of British Israel, basically. So, if we're going to go through a period of time that is basically going to be um, another exodus uh, from uh, greater than the exodus that we already experienced uh, in Egypt. So, how on earth could it be greater than that? Well, if you remember... If you go to Exodus chapter 12, let's just look at what happened in that Exodus. Because we have a lot of prophecy here that may come to pass. When God says he's going to do a greater Exodus, you have to look back on the old Exodus and see what happened in the old Exodus. And um, Exodus 12, and I have my Septuagint in front of me because um, I probably should get my... Um, King James out because I kind of have it, uh, the words in it memorized somewhat, you know. Because, uh, hi Rhonda, how you doing? So, good to see you. Um, so I'm just looking at Exodus chapter 12 because God said he's going to bring us out of oppression. And we've kind of, a lot of the people in America... Um, even though we've been living in a free land for nearly 150 years, right after the Civil War, basically our people were sold out into slavery to a certain family. 
and they decided that to pay off that debt of the Civil War, that they would use the people and give them birth certificates and use those birth certificates as kind of like collateral. So all the people for the last 150 years have actually been in oppression and not even known they were in this oppression and under this uh, slavery, basically, for over 150 years. So America hasn't really been a republic in all those years. And it had, we haven't really been free like we thought we were. We kind of were like, you know, the children of Israel in Egypt. So if you go to Exodus chapter 12, um, there's a lot of, um, verse 1 speaks about uh, how God says to Moses and Aaron in the land of Egypt saying, this month, this is chapter, verse 2 in chapter 12, this month shall be unto you the beginning of months, and it shall be the first month of the year to you. So we're kind of in that month right now, starting on March 20th. The spring equinox um, brings us to this very time where there was an exodus that we are to remember. That's what we are. Re that's what the Passover is. It's a remembrance of the old exodus from Egypt. And if you skip on down to the end of the chapter, and I can't remember exactly what verse it is. It's like in verse... Let's see, yeah, <clears throat> verse 36, or verse, uh, at verse, in verse 34, it says, the people took, this is when they left Egypt. So remember, God says, I'm going to do a greater exodus, and it's going to be so much better than that exodus from Egypt. The people took their dough before it was leavened, their kneading troughs being bound up in their clothes upon their shoulders. And the children of Israel did according to the word of Moses, and they borrowed of the Egyptians jewels of silver and jewels of gold and raiment, which is clothing. So they were highly blessed. I mean, they literally were like, just take our jewelry, take our silver, take our gold, just get out of Egypt. Just leave us alone and get out of Egypt. And the Lord gave the people favor in the sight of the Egyptians. And that's the, this is verse 36 in chapter, Exodus chapter 12. Um, God gave the people favor in the sight of the Egyptians, so that they lent unto them such things as they required. So, and they spoiled the Egyptians. So, remember, God said, I'm going to do this again, but it's going to be even greater. It's going to be more massive, more amazing than the Exodus before. And, um... I kind of feel like, you know, we're in the situation where we look around at the politics that are going on right now and we're like um, looking kind of scary, looking like um, bad, like we're trying, like, like Egypt is trying to make us make bricks out of straw. And that's kind of what uh, happened to them before they were freed. But when they were freed, they got favor. Uh, the Lord gave the people favor. So if you want to know tonight what to pray for and to help you get through uh, this hard time, I would pray Exodus chapter 12, verse 36, and the Lord gave the people favor in the sight of the Egyptians, that so they lent unto them such things as they required, and they spoiled the Egyptians. I believe that's going to happen again. And um, so some people know that as um, Nasara or Jasara, which is, you know, the financial uh, jubilee and that um, our people are going to experience it. And um, we're going to have uh, the blessings to go into the wilderness. And so the next stage after uh, we are freed from the oppression of being slaves um and having our birth certificates put up for chattel, um, basically since the last 150 years, um, that God is going to then plead with 
the people in the wilderness. So there's there there's going to come a time. So if you look in Ezekiel chapter 20, Ezekiel is uh, one of the major prophets. I always go Isaiah, Jeremiah, Ezekiel in my head. Ezekiel chapter 20, and there's a reference here to this exodus. And, and what is the purpose of it? The main purpose of it is for the, in verse 14, Exodus, I'm sorry, Ezekiel chapter 20, verse 14 is the main reason why God is going to save the people and not just punish them all and let them all uh, let the nation be completely lost. The reason why he's not going to let that happen is because everybody knows that this nation is under God. The whole world knows that. The whole world is watching. And so, but it says here in verse 14, but I wrought for my name's sake that it should not be polluted before the heathen in whose sight I brought them out. So the Lord God knows that the whole world is watching. Um, the whole world is watching what's going to happen to America. And are we going to fall into this one world order? Um, and my answer is no. No, why? Because go to verse, stay in Ezekiel chapter 20. You're going to get the answer why we are not going to fall into the one world order yet. Because we have to go through the wilderness. That is stage two of the exodus. And it's not instantaneous. Um, it could be instantaneous. I could be incorrect and it might be instantaneous. And just God returns and everything goes back to uh, the kingdom of the Lord. All the kingdoms of the earth. It could be instantaneous, but when you look at the scriptures and you look at the type, it's not. So look at verse 35. God says, and I will bring you into the wilderness of the people, and there will I plead with you face to face. So we're going to go through a greater exodus, a more magnificent, uh, more meaningful. In this sense, it's going to be like a spiritual wilderness. But physically, we're not going to have um, uh, fear. We're not going to be surrounded by fear. We're not going to be surrounded by um, oppression. I think we're going to be released from the oppression. And, and in doing so, the rest of the world can experience freedom too. Because that's what America does. When America gets that freedom, we, we spread it to the rest of the world. And we help all the countries in which were affected by this corrupt regime that has ruled the world. So God says, I'm going to plead with you in the wilderness. So how long might the wilderness be? Well, in the Exodus, the wilderness was 40 years. Um, but they were only supposed to be in the wilderness for two years. So if you go to Revelation, it does give you a timeline. And Revelation chapter 12. Revelation chapter 12 is a beautiful chapter. It's called a parenthetical chapter. Meaning it, it's like it has everything that's going to happen all in one chapter that has happened in the first earth age um, all the way, I would say, till about the sixth trump, Satan's arrival. So if you go to Revelation chapter 12, you've got this little, uh, this little key, this little pattern. Um, nobody can take this away from you. When you read it, it is God giving you the roadmap. So nobody can ever come and say, well, that's not going to happen. You could say, but it's written. Chapter 12, verse uh, 6. So the first five verses uh, are all talking about um, basically the first earth age. Is the, the woman in the first earth age. And then now we have the woman giving birth to the Christ child in verse uh, 4. 
and uh, the prophecy in verse 5 that he's going to rule all the nations with a rod of iron. But then the child, which is Jesus Christ, was caught up unto God and to his throne. So there you have basically what has already happened in the past. Verse 6 brings us to a future prophecy that has not occurred yet. Verse 6 says, Revelation chapter 12, verse 6. And the woman, who is the woman? She's the one that brought forth the Christ child. She's the seed line of Israel. That special seed line. And the woman fled into the wilderness. Remember God said, I'm going to plead with you where? Where she hath a place prepared of God. God prepared the wilderness. So I don't think it's going to be a place full of concentration camps and people hunting you down uh, for your religion and your beliefs. Uh, we're going to be full of fear um, and enslaved. I think the wilderness is a place of freedom. And I think that it's being prepared of God as we speak. And why? Why would God prepare this special place so that the church can grow up? The church right now is kind of a baby. Um, so when you think of all the Christians right now in America, they're all crying out to God to save them from uh, a satanic regime that wants to rule the entire world. So the Christians in America are crying out. They're united as one. They don't really have much knowledge on doctrine. All they know is that this is an evil regime and they want to be saved. So this is a great time for God to actually save, come through, show the world how powerful he is. And then the woman can go there and um, they're going to feed her there a thousand two hundred and three score days, which is about three and a half years. So given that we haven't gone into that wilderness yet, this three and a half years is probably going to play out exactly as it is written. Now, I could be wrong and this time might be shortened and that, you know, that certainly is a possibility, but this is not, this three and a half years is not the time where Satan is on the earth during the tribulation. It's not a tribulation period. It is a pre-tribulation period, if you will, um, of safety and of where God can plead. And I, and I think back to Ezekiel chapter 20, verse 35, the verse I just read, that God pleads with her in the wilderness. And why? Because it's going to be a greater exodus. And obviously at the end of that time period, we're going to go through that short captivity of Satan, probably about two and a half months, and then the second advent of the Lord. So, I mean, even if it is a three and a half period that's not shortened, that's really not a long, that's not a great deal of time. But it is enough time for the church to grow up um, in the Word of God. And, and why do I say that? Because when you go to Revelation chapter 2 and chapter 3 of Revelation, what do you have? You have seven churches. Two of those churches God is happy with. Five he's not happy with. When you look around at the layout of the churches today, do you see... A lot of division. I mean, yes, there is different denominations, but I see everybody uniting together as one against the evil cabal that's trying to take over the world. I see good versus evil. I see good uniting together into one church. So the layout is not quite what it needs to be for that final battle. So what we need is a time where, we, where God can plead with us. He's got to plead with all seven of those churches. He's got to meet them doctrinally. Let them have time to explore their, their doctrine and read the Bible and learn the Bible and know the truth. They need that time in the wilderness where he prepared 
It's a special time prepared for them. And you remember the children of Israel in the wilderness, they weren't very obedient. They didn't really say, oh, thank you, Lord, for this manna. Um, and manna, manna is symbolic of the word of God. So we're going into a period, and I feel a lot of Christians from all walks, all different denominations, they're all coming together, they're all praying um, in their own way, and they're, they're begging the Lord to save our nation. And I believe he's going to, but that's when he's going to meet them in the wilderness. And that's going to be a great time for them to be met in the wilderness to hear from him. So if you continue on in Revelation chapter 12 and you want to know about that time period, that roadmap I was telling you about, um, if you go to verse, uh, well, if you just keep reading, the devil is cast out of heaven. So that's why I know in verse 6, it's not the tribulation. It's before he's cast out. So if you go into verse 7, there was war in heaven. And there's that devil, Satan, which deceiveth the whole world. He was cast out into the earth in verse 9. And that's when the angel said, now has come salvation. Think about that. The, the three and a half years wasn't the salvation. That was the pleading. Now comes the salvation. Because now he's going to come directly to earth. The now is instantaneously. So there's not going to be a sneaking around where he hides for two and a half months. It's instantaneous kicked out to earth arrival. And so that's why it says, Now has come salvation and strength and the kingdom of our God and the power of his Christ, for the accuser of our brethren is cast down, which accused them before our God day and night. And verse 11, They overcame him by the, by the blood of the Lamb and by the word of their testimony, and loved not their lives unto the death. So if you keep going, it gives you the time in verse 14. Does it say three and a half years in verse 14? No. It says, it gives you the parable. And to the woman were given two wings of a great eagle that she might fly into the wilderness, into her place where she is nourished for a time, times, and a half a time from the face of the serpent. So we're given a direct time period that she is protected from the face, meaning he's, he's there de facto. He's there facing her. This is the tribulation time period. Now, originally, Satan was given that three and a half years, but it's a parable. And Christ said there would be no flesh saved if we don't shorten the time. And I believe that's what we're seeing right now. If this three and a half years coming up were given to the serpent, they, they would succeed in their depopulation agenda. They would succeed, but they're not going to because Christ shortened the time. Now, he didn't short time itself. He didn't say, oh, I'm going to delete this time from, from existence. The time that originally given to Satan, three and a half years, still exists. But instead of it being given to Satan for a mass depopulation agenda, it is given to the woman. And, and he pleads with her. And it's a special time. It's going to be greater than the exodus from Egypt. Uh, and, and more important, mostly because the exodus from Egypt was more physical. This one's going to be a spiritual conversation that the Lord is going to have with the people. All these people that are praying for him to save our nation. They need that moment where they meet God in his word and hear directly from him. 
And then that final time period that Satan has was originally three and a half years where no flesh would be saved, but God shortened it. What did he shorten it to? Well, there's different, it's a parable. So it is by nature speculative because how long is a time? I would suspect that God's word would tell us. Originally, the time was 360 days, which, which led you to three and a half years. But that time was shortened because no flesh would have been able to survive the mass depopulation agenda. So actually, if you look in Daniel chapter 10, and no discussion for me would be complete without going to Daniel. Daniel chapter 10 says something very interesting. It says um, in verse 1, Daniel chapter 10, 10, the thing was true, but the time appointed was long. The time appointed. So this is not chapter 9. What time appointed is he discussing? Well, he's about to go through a three-week period of mourning. That time was appointed. God appoints time. We're just not wandering through space willy-nilly, wondering where we're going and how long we're going to be there and when it's going to end. And It's not willy-nilly. God sets the clock. And yes, he took that three and a half years away from Satan, but how do we know how long that time is now, now that it's shortened? Well, in Daniel chapter 10, it says that the time appointed was long. Now, what happens in Daniel chapter 10? For 21 days, he mourns. He's in mourning for the people. He's devastated. And on the 4 and 20th day of the first month, the angel finally comes to him. Now, that period of time is not just the what Daniel experienced and never to be repeated, but it, it says that the time appointed was long. That means it's prophetic. So how long was that time that he had to wait to hear? It was 21 days is how long the time. So if you take the parable, the time times and half a time and put 21 days in there, it comes out to about 73 and a half days, which is about two and a half months. So the, the new timeline for Satan has been shortened to two and a half months, which happens to be half of five months, which is interesting because three and a half years is half of seven years. So we're given the timeline right from Revelation 12, that time, times and a half, were reminded of the only time Satan was ever given in, in the book of Daniel was that phrase, a time, times and a half a time. It was that three and a half years original and then shortened down to two and a half months, which works perfectly because in the book of Revelation, you're told that, that they got five months to do their thing. But they waste the first half, warring God in heaven. Uh, which is what Satan has always wanted to do. If you see in uh, Isaiah chapter 14, you see that Satan's goal was to ascend to heaven. He gets that opportunity, and the first thing he does is he ascends to heaven like smoke in Revelation chapter um, 9. So if you look in Isaiah 14, you get to see what Satan's, uh, I think it's verse 14. Yeah, it's verse 14, so it's easy to remember, Isaiah 14, 14. Um, in verse 13, for thou hast said in thine heart, I will ascend into heaven that's what he that's what his main goal is 
So you imagine he's freed from bondage and his army is freed from hell. They don't really want to go to earth. They don't really want to rule the earth. They want to go to heaven. They want to take over God first, then take over the earth. For thou hast said in thine heart, I will ascend into heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I will also sit upon the mount of the congregation in the sides of the north. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will be like the most high. Then, of course, it says, yet thou shalt be brought down to hell to the sides of the pit. The pit the sides of the pit is where his army is. In Revelation 9, he's given a key. And in the Greek, it says, this key goes to the shaft, to the pit. And obviously, he's going to go to let the army out. And once he gets his troops in behind him, up they go. So, that gives you... Revelation 12, again, gives you all of that in that chapter. The entire map of what's going to happen in that first three and a half years where the woman is put into the wilderness is the time that God is going to plead with her. It's, it's the time of witnessing. It is a great time of witnessing. So you find that also in... Um, I think Revelation chapter 11, that there's a time of witnessing of two witnesses. And we're told the two witnesses are not only the two olive trees, but they're two um, churches, two candlesticks. Um, so there's two churches who are able to witness Smyrna and Philadelphia. In Revelation chapter 2, 9 and 3, 9, Smyrna and Philadelphia know that those that claim they are of Judah and are not, but are of the synagogue of Satan. So those two churches will have that message for that time period. Until finally, when he does arrive, then the two olive branches, um, the two olive trees, sons of oil, if you've studied that, Zechariah 4, then they have their witness and their testimony. So it's interesting to see the two time periods overlaying and eventually leading to the greater exodus. And so in the Septuagint, it has Jeremiah 23 verse 7 at the end of the chapter. It doesn't have it. And it's not this Septuagint, um, it's the one, the digital one. So this is edition number two, the printed one is edition number two. And the edition number one is the digital edition in Logos. That one has these um, chapter and verses a little different. Now why the printed one, again, is different... I will never know. Well, maybe I will. I don't know. Maybe somebody will tell me one day why they did that. I wish they would just printed exactly what the digital edition had because it's priceless. I think that the placement of the verses, to me, it stands out. To me, it cries um, something extremely significant. Um, so you go to uh, Jeremiah chapter 23, and I'll close it with this. And what it's talking about, if you go to 23 verse 33, um, it's talking about, in the Septuagint, it's talking about, um, in the King James it says, those who cry the burden of the Lord. Um, in the Septuagint, it's not really that they're crying a burden of the Lord, which I kind of thought that was significant, burden of the Lord, because many people say, you know, that we're all going to have to put up with this satanic regime to rule the entire world right now. Um, but that is a really heavy burden, and I don't think God is going to put that burden on the children. 
that are caught up in in this satanic web of lies i think he's going to free the children and i got other scriptures that go along with that so if you read in jeremiah 23 verse 33 and if this people or a priest or a prophet would ask you instead of saying what is the burden of the lord the septuagint translates it what is the oracle of the lord so if you're to go up to a priest or a prophet and you were to ask them, what is the oracle of the Lord? What would many of them say? What, what would they say is going to happen? Would they say there's a greater exodus coming? Then you shall say to them, you are the oracle and I will strike you, says the Lord. As for the prophet and the priest and the people who might say, oracle of the Lord, seven years of torture, murder and mayhem. That's a lie. Satan does not have seven years. Never, ever in scripture did it say that the Antichrist would have seven years. It does not say it. It's not in there. That is a lie. So then I will avenge that person in his house. This is what you shall say, each to his friend and each to his brother. What was answered by the Lord? And what has the Lord spoken? Well, the Lord said... I'm going to give you a greater exodus and do not call it oracle of the lord any longer because his word to humankind will be the oracle he's going to plead with them in the wilderness and give them that truth that manna that was passed out in the wilderness and why has the lord our god spoken therefore this is what the lord our god says because those of you who have said this word oracle of the lord and i sent to you saying you shall not say oracle of the lord therefore look i myself am taking and striking you in the city <clears throat> that i have given you and your fathers and i will place an eternal reproach and an eternal dishonor into you that will not be forgotten it's interesting he says therefore look this is in verse 39 i myself am taking and striking you and the city that i have given you and your fathers that's jerusalem they are going to be uh brought back to jerusalem that's that greater exodus. And so this is where the Septuagint puts verse 7 and 8 in that same chapter. In the digital edition, not the printed edition, which I'm looking at. In the digital edition, you go to verse 7. That's what comes after what I just read to you about the oracle of the Lord in the city. Therefore, look, and I like that word, therefore. So when you use the word therefore, you're saying, based on what I just said about don't say this is the oracle of the Lord for the city. Don't say the Jews have already returned. They haven't. Therefore, look, the days are coming, saith the Lord, and they will no longer say, as the Lord lives who brought up the house of Israel from the land of Egypt, but as the Lord lives, who gathered all the seed of Israel from the land of the north and from all the territories where he had thrust them and restored them to their land. That's the oracle of the Lord. That's what the Lord speaks. A greater exodus is coming. More magnificent. Probably because it's spiritual. The spiritual condition is being addressed. Not just the physical location of the people, but their, their physical condition is being taken care of, so there's no fear. And then the spiritual is the next thing to be addressed. So right now you see everybody united together praying against the satanic cabal, which is a good thing. And after they're brought down, because Jesus Christ shortened the time. He took that three and a half years away from Satan. And he gave it to us. 
so that we can meet him in the wilderness for that final test until we finally go into the promised land at the second advent, which is the very last trump, it's the very last thing. So that is what I wanted to cover because I read that in the Septuagint in the digital edition again. So if you are able to just purchase this one book um, from the Logos Bible software, you would want to get this one. It's about $25. I don't get any kickbacks from that. Um, I'm just letting you know. There is an online Septuagint that is free, but they don't have the chapters and the verses arranged either, <laughs> like that one digital edition. So there's only one digital edition that I could find that is exactly like that. And that is the one in the Logos Bible software. It's the Lexham English Septuagint first edition, which is the digital edition. The second edition is the printed edition, which is beautiful. I mean, I think this is, if you can get it, it's beautiful. But they didn't arrange, they didn't address the um, verses that are put in a different order. They didn't address that. And, and uh, I guess they were just trying to not stir up any trouble. I don't know. I mean, they sure didn't ask me. But I, the digital edition is awesome, and it's a blessing. And um, I'll try to bring to you, you know, by video, everything that I find in that Septuagint. Because to me, it's a great treasure. It's like a hidden um, treasure with the most ancient Hebrew um, gives us uh, a total of like 80 some books in um, the whole Bible. Obviously the the Old Testament, I think I wrote it down. How many Old Testament books are there? There's like an additional, it's way more than the Hebrew. Um, there it is, 54. 54 Old Testament books as opposed to like uh, 40 or something. I, I didn't do the math. But there's, there's a lot of exciting stuff in the Septuagint. So the next study that I wanted to do was the New World Order. And I wanted to discuss how the current world order like if you're watching any of this stuff that's going on right now, there's this satanic cabal human trafficking ring that controls the entire world. And they're basically in control, or have been in control. Uh, but there's this possibility. And, and how it can occur, I'm not privy to that information. But there's this possibility that they may be removed from power. So the world order that everybody is seeing right now may be completely removed and replaced by what they call the light world order. Um, and that would probably be run by Trump and uh, his, his money system called Nasara Jasara, which is all good. There's nothing evil about it. Um, but it will be um, a freedom loving Christian free thought uh, system that's going to be put into place. And that's the system upon which Satan will arrive, I believe. And when he does arrive, he's going to say, look at what I have blessed you with. I, I am the one that did this. Just like he steals and he takes over everything and says that it's his own, God is the one that's going to do it. But when Satan arrives, he's going to say, he did it. And he's actually responsible for the current dark cabal order that is um, unbelievably demonic. And I believe that one's going to be exposed to the world. So when they worship him, thinking he's actually God, and they find out at the end of the tribulation, they find out who he really is, that he really was Satan. 
the one who ran the dark cabal human trafficking ring that they've been running for years. Uh, ungodly, unconscionable acts of demonic despotism. Uh, imagine when you find out that you actually worshipped the wrong god, the one that did all this demonic stuff that's going to be exposed. It's about to be exposed. Imagine finding out that, that you actually worshipped that guy, not the true Christ. That's probably why they're going to call for the rocks to fall on them, the sixth seal, because they'll know. At that point, they will have full knowledge of who he is and what he did and is doing currently. But uh, the, the world order that is coming is going to be the light order. It's going to be good. Uh, and I don't think there's anything evil about it until Satan takes it over. Because when he arrives, he's just going to steal the system that God has instituted in the earth through Trump. He's just going to steal it. He's going to take claim to it and tell everybody that he did it because he's a thief. Um, and that's what uh, the world needs to be prepared for through God's word and hopefully through the witnessing of God's elect everybody can hear um, who the next one to arrive is and hopefully that when they hear that that you know they'll look at that seal of God in their forehead from studying his word and that's what I see coming and I see of course you know God's word and his prophecy is awesome and I'm, I'm excited to see it come to pass. Um, and I think it'll be a good thing. Um, so, yeah. So I'll probably talk about the New World Order next. I just wanted to get that uh, thought off my chest about how the Septuagint phrases Jeremiah chapter 23, verse 7, putting at the end of the conversation about the Oracle of the Lord. So I hope you guys enjoy that. I don't see any questions or anything. Um, in the comment section, but if you do have a, a question or a comment, just put it in there. And if somebody shares the video, hopefully you can come back to my page and um, ask questions. But if, if I don't see it, uh, I obviously can't answer any questions if I don't see it. So uh, everybody have a good night, and hopefully we can do some more Bible studies together and see our country come back and... Uh, I'm really positive about that coming back. All right. Everybody have a great night.